Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be interviewing Fiona Pelham, who is the CEO of Positive Impact, a global nonprofit transforming the event sector towards sustainability. Fiona has fostered collaborations with multiple UN bodies, including UN Climate Change and UN Environment, aligning event strategies with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In 2019, Fiona made a pivotal decision to close down her own business to focus entirely on her nonprofit work, ensuring transparency and dedication to the sector's transformation. Her efforts have not gone unnoticed. She was the youngest ever female chair of the International Standard for Sustainability and Events, and has been honored with an honorary doctorate for her contributions to the event industry. Now residing in Copenhagen, Fiona is a creative force committed to sustainable practices and mentoring the next generation of leaders. We look forward to exploring Fiona's journey, her achievements, and her vision for a more connected and sustainable world. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thanks, everybody, that's made it to be here during the live recording. I really appreciate that. Oh, it's really wonderful. Uh, Fiona, I, let's let's just kind of start with uh, a definition of sustainability. Uh, you know, it's a term that is, I don't think it means the same thing to each person. And it's also something that's somewhat politicized. So mm. let, let's just create a basic definition of sustainability. But I think what's interesting to realize is 20 years ago when I started in my career, I didn't really understand what the definition of sustainability was. I had been a Girl Scout leader and I knew that community events made a difference. And I lived in Austin, Texas, and I learned about composting. So I knew that there was an environmental side. So I went into my career thinking, I want to make a difference to the planet and also a community impact. There are now definitions of sustainability. I mean, the, the accepted academic one is an enduring and balanced approach to making sure that you leave no impact for future generations. But the thing that really brings it to life for me is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And they're important because they're they're the roadmap that everyone is following. It's not it's not really going to help you if I give you my lovely definition of sustainability today. But if I signpost you to those goals, it's 17 goals that have indicators and targets. And if every company shaped around those, if every human looked at their life and matched them to those goals and targets, we'd then be in a world that that would work for us all. Mm, that's great. Um, well, what what brought you into this field? Yeah, I've touched on it slightly there, but I, it, it really does start with the Landmark Forum 20 years ago, pretty much almost to the month. Um, I was working in what I thought was my dream job in London. And when I did the Landmark Forum, I realized that we all die. So we should live our lives the way we want to live them. And I realized that I'd always wanted to run my own business. And that was enough for me to, within a month, um, give them my notice and set up a company planning events with those passions of wanting the events I planned to make a difference to the community and also to the environment. And then it all just moved forward from there. Mm. You know, for people that may be listening who aren't familiar with Landmark, one of the things that we're really committed to as an organization is people being empowered to make the difference that they want to make in the world. And uh, that's a commonality among the people that we interview in this series. Uh, it, let's also, um, you know, you're, you're obviously concerned for the future and you must have some kind of vision for what yeah. that future could be. Could you articulate that? Yes. Um, I think we're living in an amazing time, really, especially having gone through COVID, where all of a sudden we pivoted to online connection. So we're now in a moment where really everyone's voice could be heard. So what I see for the future of how we engage and connect and collaborate as humans is that we're learning more about how we work as humans and how we can involve everybody. Um, I could talk a lot about this, but we've seen the shifts online to 
involve groups that were maybe never involved in the big events. You'll see many events in the photos that I'm sharing below and they are amazing and they are wonderful human connectors. But now that we have this online opportunity, we can bring in um, new voices. And what I'd really love to do today in the time that we have together is share as many stories as possible that can bring this to life. Um, and I'll start, if it's okay, with sharing a story on an initiative that we're doing right now called the Pavilion for People. So many of you may or may not know big events around the world, big exhibitions. They have these physical stands called pavilions and people will walk around and they'll network and they'll shake hands. And the climate change conference that happens every year has many of those very big pavilions and businesses from around the world will come and the negotiators come and we really realized that not everyone can get on a plane and go to that location. So how could it be possible for other people's voices to be heard? And the team at the not-for-profit and I, uh, the not-for-profit I run and I, um, created some ideas around this. And two years ago, we launched the Pavilion for People. It's a virtual interactive space where people can share their ideas and thoughts and a few months ago, a not-for-profit who works with people who are living within the last mile of climate change decided that rather than spend their budget for their CEO to get on a plane and go to the COP conference in November, they would spend their budget on the Pavilion for People so that 100 of their community leaders from East Africa, people who are living a mile within climate change, could come to the virtual pavilion and share their stories. Mm. And we had our first meeting last week about this and four of the community leaders came online and I really learned something from them, which was how precious their stories were. They, they said, our stories are what we have. We want to share them in a way that there is trust and there is a listening and I think that for me is the vision of the future that we're all able to share our stories in a space of trust and listening. And from there, we can find solutions on how we work together as humans on this planet. You know, you provoke something uh, for me, which is, um, you know, those of us that, you know, are able to connect to this meeting on Zoom um, live in countries that are fully developed. We're, we're pretty insulated from even if climate change is affecting our countries, we're, we're relatively insulated from that experience. But you talk about people that live within a mile of climate change. Could you just paint a picture of what that might look for one person? So one of the, and I'm, I'm very sensitive as well of, of sharing their stories now after, after our conversations last week, because I realized their stories are really there to share. So I will give my interpretation of, of that based on, on sure. the, the relationship yeah. that we're, we're building. Um, so one of the community leaders said, when I'm bringing my community here, many of the stories they share may be, we have to go out looking for firewood to burn, to cook food. And there's not firewood close by because there's not plants growing because of the weather and climate change. And a long walk to get firework is dangerous for women. And I may be bringing a community leader into this uh, environment to share a story of how they were raped because they were looking for firewood. And the conversation then is how, how can we fund solar cookers? so that all of a sudden people's lives change and they have access to solar cooking facility rather than having to look for firewood. Mm. And I think what's magical about the Pavilion for People, the potential that it has, is that these stories can be being shared and anyone can be listening to them. So maybe it's going to be a student that hears those stories that changes their career that champions change and makes a difference. Maybe it's going to be a philanthropist who says, I could solve that problem and I could take action or a climate negotiator. One of the visions we have for the, the pavilion is being able to represent all the conversations that are going on in the world and connect that with the negotiators so that they're able to say, oh, look, there's a thousand people right now from Asia all talking together and they're all saying they'd like a commitment on I don't know, more bike paths around Asia. We should 
we should recognize that that's people wanting change and, and put that in the negotiation. So it's trying to connect these systems that we live in of negotiations and governments and, and hierarchies and policies with the humanness that we have mm. and the desires that we have for change and, and living in a way that works for us all. Well, that that um, th- that's a really, really kind of crucial aspect of this from what I've seen in your work. Uh, there are people that are making you know choices and decisions that uh, create policies that have a huge, huge impact on, on millions and millions of people. And at the same time, you know the 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 challenges that the planets are facing require those policies. Yeah. But that's not going to be enough. They require the the buy-in, the cooperation, the action of people who may not even have a self interest, an immediate yeah. self interest in addressing those challenges. Yeah. And I think that's been a really interesting part of my career, because I think at the start of my career, I don't know that I would have said, yes, I want my career to be about challenging the status quo and existing systems and existing business models. But that's really where I've played a lot in my career, like being the person that's brave enough to say, actually, that doesn't quite work. That business model is broken or challenging things. Um, So... Yeah. What was your what was your question, Samus? Well, got you've got you've got this tension. You know, I I look at you know the uh, there's a politicization of uh, some aspects of dealing with climate change, sustainability, and the like. And this is an the statement doesn't have anything to do with what people's position is on that, but politicization gets in the way of action hmm. and action that's effective. And I think one of the things that I'm interested in is how how do we how do we create I, I guess I'll say this way, how do we get ordinary people whose personal concerns are not aligned with sustainability to recognize the need and act? This sustainability is is everything. If you look at the the sustainable development goals, um it covers everything from gender equality to everyone having a, a great working life um, to everyone having great, healthy environments. How do we get action on it? I think it's creativity and and collaboration. So I think it's shifting the narrative from this is hard, this is serious to what could the vision be? You know, if you ask young people, children or young teenagers about what they see for the future, you see a lot of creativity that, that comes from that. And then you look at how we operate as adults in these systems that sort of don't work. So how do we create a systems change? And I, I think it's through inspiration. And I, again, in my career, I've really learned that it's not through suggesting something or it's not through pointing at something as uh, that's not going to work. It's actually taking the action and making something happen. And again, going back to the Pavilion for People, we started that with zero funding. We, we operate now on a very small amount of funding. If we had more funding, the impact would be huge. But we actually started it with zero. And I think many people wouldn't even start at that point. Um, so it's being comfortable with all the no's that you get and just doing it anyway. So maybe a maybe if everyone had a good dose of stubbornness and inspiration, that's the tools we need. <laughs> Well, the you know, the there's a lot of resistance that's out there, and the motivations for that resistance. I'm sure, there's probably you know big moneyed interests that are resisting it because of the economic incentives, but there's also resistance that you could maybe describe as just a deep resignation. You know the. There's talk about how, you know, there's young people that don't want to have children because they're concerned about the future. And, you know, we saw during the pandemic, um, you know, just a, a real rise in personal isolation and people kind of retreating from yeah. being involved in life and um, much less making a difference. Mm-hmm. What is the thing you see in your work that, defies that 
it's the human to human connection. It's the moment when two people that don't know each other are sitting next to each other and having lunch together or are in a Zoom breakout room and sharing something. And I think it's the moment that we all realize this is someone that looks different from me, comes from a different place from me, but actually has the same concerns and cares. And that's so, so basic, really. You know, we all we all have family. We all have people that we love. And it's about being able to connect with other people around that and then then have an opening for action. So one of the campaigns that we do is called um, Share a Positive Impact, encouraging people to share a best practice uh, initiative they've done at an event. Um, and people share really small things like they put a recycling bin out or they'll share like more major transformations like they're now going to have a procurement department that focuses more on, on sustainability but it's encouraging people, allowing people to share their stories and giving them the opportunity to do so that I think is is really valuable. And that will overcome resistance. Yeah. You know, what the, uh, to talk about virtual events for a minute, um, you know, Landmark, uh, prior to the pandemic, we delivered personal development programs of all different kinds to 10,000, 15,000 people a week. Uh, all in person yeah. with people traveling to those locations, giving paper handouts to people and assignments to people during the yeah. course. And when the pandemic hit, um, it was, you know, an imperative, not knowing how long this was going to last. Uh, and given, you know, we certainly couldn't have people in theater style seating at the, at the height of the pandemic. Yeah. It just wasn't, in many places it wasn't even allowed. Um it it pushed us in a direction that we've had to continue. Yeah. To, to where I, now, well, I, I'll make a quick point. I'd love to have you respond to. Yeah. to we, it's pushed us in a direction to where now all of our programs are online, but suddenly there are no borders. So where people yeah. used to just have a community of people around a, a, a geographic location, let's say Chicago, where I live. Now people are connected to people, not just elsewhere within the United States, North America, they're connected to people in India, they're connected to people in, you know, throughout Africa, Europe. That's a complete transformation in the way that the community of people that have done Landmark programs, we call them Landmark graduates, are relating to one another. Yeah. And I think that is a wonderful example of how we don't know what we don't know. So I'll share a, a really great story here. A few people who were on the call um, were involved with me in suggesting to Landmark for the global conference that it became a virtual global conference rather than everyone traveling over to LA. And we put a really great proposal in, in 2019, 2018, 2019, for the conference to be virtual. And the feedback was, not right now. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and all of a sudden the conference did become virtual. And it was a really great moment of, well, first of all, it was a great moment of all of us that worked on it thinking, oh, wow, how powerful are we? We just said we really want the conference to be online. <laughs> and now it is online. Um, but also realizing that we as humans, we do live in the space of we don't know what we don't know because it has worked in a way that we we never could have foreseen that it would work. And I think that's going to be what's going to be happening to us more and more as in as humans in the future. And those connections that you mentioned, like meeting someone in Africa or in Australia and, and the building of those friendships and realizing that we're all human. I think that is going to be some amazing solutions that come from that and amazing creativity. And we just have to look at the younger generations who really do operate without borders and their ability to to care for people who are not just the people on their road. Yeah, that's a that's a really fascinating thing. I mean, we're we're in a time where there are people who are alive who remember a completely analog world. You know, who use paper rolodexes, who, you know, had to go to do business, you had to travel to actually see your client. 
to people that had kind of a hybrid experience, kind of, you know, adapting with technologies that influenced work to now, you know, I have a 15 year old daughter who has friendships that I, I'm amazed at how little she gets together with those friends in person. And I would have told you, you know, not long ago that, oh, that can't be the same as a, you know, in my day where you got on your bike and you went to somebody's house <laughs> to find out if they're yeah. home and then wandered around. And, um, but that's not the case. There is intimate and human connection is independent of medium is what I've yeah. really come to get. And for a company like Landmark that is about human connection, that's about empowering people, what would you have to say about, you know, this, people that may be skeptical perhaps about, you know, oh, why is it online? I miss being able to do things in person, of which yeah. just for the record, people can still do that. Still do that. We do have programs in person, but we're not organized uh, the way we used to be. And it's yeah. it's not going back to that. I think, unfortunately, as humans, we often put things in binary, like good, bad, right, wrong. So it's which should it be, face-to-face -face or virtual? And there's um, a lot of conversations around that. And really, the reality is we're, we're past that now. How are we going to evolve ourselves so that we can exist and connect and collaborate in a world that's got so much technology and really has got a massive call, a massive need for us all to collaborate as humans on this one planet to protect our planet. Um, so I, I think it's innovation and creativity. That's what the future is rather than um, harking back to how good previous times were. And again, we you can't compare and yeah, there's many studies that say things like, I remember uh, right at the start of the pandemic, reading things around the way our brain works and how our brain would sense more danger if it can't see the full body of a person. And obviously on Zoom, we just see our, our heads. And I think back about that data now, and I think, I wonder if it's evolved or our, our brains have just evolved because there's definitely more and more examples of people creating trust and building trust from just meeting virtually but also there's an understanding of we are all different like what what about the introverts what about the people that that can't travel what how how are their voices being heard and I think some of the tech that we're seeing um some of the, the tech that we use at positive impact it's not just about us talking and seeing each other's faces it's also about surveys or people being able to write things and express themselves in a way that works for them you know a funny thing um I'm curious if this is your experience but you know a lot of the a lot of the same people and this is not this is not denigrating in any way but a lot of the same people that say i would like to do things in person also very much want flexibility mm -hmm. and you know i remember uh studying anthropology um in school and the thing i remember is that you know we're we're primates as humans we are primates we're part of that genus and um all of us need to touch all of us need to hug all of us need that human contact and um what's your answer to that you know for people that really we definitely do need that and i think what we may see is more local community. I mean, I can just answer this from my own uh, perspective. So up to um, COVID, I was traveling massively. I chaired an international, the, the largest association for the event sector. So I was constantly traveling the world in relation to that. I chair the ISO standard, ISO 2012 one. So again, a lot of travel. Um, and then COVID happened, no travel. And since COVID, I really haven't traveled at all. And I've seen, I've created my local hub, my, my community that meets the emotional needs I have for humans. And then I have my work. And again, working in sustainability and climate change, I'm incredibly conscious every time I step on a plane, what's going to be the impact from this. Early on in my career, I thought the impact was going to be People will change behavior. They'll be inspired by seeing me face to face. 
And that was a lot of the anecdotal feedback. But then the systems around that didn't change. So I got frustrated with, well, nothing is changing. So let me try and change my approach. So that's a long winded way of saying we're we're living in a time where our planet is also having a bit of a conversation with us. So we need to adapt to that. And it could be more engagement in your local community and then using technology to remain as global citizens as opposed to 50 years ago where we were maybe using planes and trains to be global citizens. It's funny you say that because to go back a hundred years and and for all all of human history before that, yeah, people didn't travel. Yeah, yeah. And I think now the the climate change that we're seeing and it, that is a shared concern for us all. So we are now default global citizens in that conversation and, and in conversations about health and disease, as we saw from COVID, you know, that that didn't stay within borders. So we are global citizens with what's happening around us and we can live locally for for our own healthy sakes. Yeah. Positive Impact is a unique organization and I'm I'm wondering what does it take to run a, a, mm. a business like this and with a vision yeah. like this? I would say Positive Impact is a purposeful business. It's coming up to um, 20 years now that I've been running Positive Impact as a not-for-profit. And as you mentioned before, I also ran a consultancy alongside it for a while and then closed that to focus purely on the not-for-profit. And that has given me the space to bring people together and build relationships. And I'm constantly coming back to the purpose. What's the purpose of Positive Impact? So a sustainable way for humans to be connecting. That's the purpose. Um, and I'm constantly interested by the challenges I have around the business case, because you would think businesses with a purpose that makes a difference for everybody would thrive, would be supported, would be what everybody needs. But it, one of the unexpected challenges I have is, is having to make the business case for providing uh, money to Positive Impact. And I'll, I'll give a very easy example. We've got New York Climate Week coming up in September. There is going to be a lot of events happening. We are currently in conversations with about five or six people and they're deciding between their coffee and pastry budgets at New York Climate Week or supporting the pavilion for people. And when you, I think that's been a surprise to me in my career that, that people can think, oh yeah, I should give coffee and pastries to 50 people in New York that might not want a pastry and maybe have their own reusable cup with them anyway and aren't so bothered. Or I could invest the money and, and make a bigger difference. Um, so what has it taken? It's definitely taken courage, um, being unstoppable, speaking up, but then I think also keep bringing myself back to what the big vision is and feeling that from a common sense perspective, surely this vision is going to advance everybody. So surely this is the future of business as opposed to what I can often see around me, which is um, just another consulting company saying, hey, we'll do this piece of work. Yeah, you know, something that's noticeably missing in the way you describe this is those tactics that are often employed that are kind of guilt in some degree of manipulation. Yeah. And um, what I really hear is uh, you know, you're, you're sharing a possibility with people with an intention yes. to inspire them. Correct. And I think my what I've really learned in my career is one of the things I learned from um, the wisdom course, which is one of the tips, which is they're not responding to you. In other words, when you're suggesting things to people, when you're giving them opportunities um, and they're saying why or no, it's not them responding to me. It's just having an understanding that the system that they work in right now doesn't allow them to say yes. The system that we work in right now is, it's just play rude if you walk into an event at New York Climate Week and there isn't coffee and pastries. So obviously that budget has to be used. So it's how to give people an excuse to do something differently. Hmm. Um, 
a couple more questions before we wrap this up. You, you are committed to developing the next generation of leadership in, in this movement. What is that like? What do people mm. who aren't the young generation uh, or part of that generation rather, what do they not know? What are, what are, what are they underestimating about the next generation of leadership? Yeah. So within Positive Impact, we have a um, community of ambassadors. Anyone can volunteer to be an ambassador. And we have 2,000 in the community from over 60 countries. And we support them with resources so that they can use their voice. And we regularly hear from the younger members of that community who are really challenging the governments, challenging the status quo, going straight to the policymakers, not waiting around for 20 years until they've got the right job title to do that, just going straight in and saying, this doesn't work for our future. So I think one thing that I'm really learning is, is the power of people's voices and how younger people are not afraid to use their voice, which is fantastic. Um, and then I, I think the speed of change, it's about the speed of change is an opportunity for us. And it's an opportunity for us as as humankind and being in that possibility and opportunity rather than being in the clinging to that it should be this way it has always been this way um going back to my coffee and pastry example i can really imagine in the next year new york climate week people will arrive for breakfast and there'll be a sign saying scan this qr code if you don't want a coffee and pastry and that budget will be spent somewhere else and all of the young people will be scanning that because they'll be thinking why would i want a pastry when when this money could be used to ensure that communities in in other areas of the world are engaged that's a great example of the creativity you're talking about yeah um, yeah uh, this is a question that uh, I've begun asking in these interviews uh, that I, I, is based on a premise, and that is that everybody who takes on something that is big and has a, a lot of inertia and certainly what you know, implement, bring, bringing the world to a new level of sustainability, there's a lot of inertia. Hmm. You bump up against your own resignation. You bump up against your own despair, cynicism. Yeah. Um, but what keeps people going is there's something that moves them. There's hmm. something that deeply moves them. And I'm wondering if you could share an example of something that you've experienced in this journey that really moves you. Yeah. And before I do that, I was just laughing when you said deep inertia, because I had a conversation today with um, a very influential company that could make a, a really big difference. And they were just like, oh, we'll just chat again in a month. And and I found myself really saying to them, no, we can't. The time is now. So, yes, inertia is there. There's so many things that have really deeply moved me. Um so I'm gonna I'm gonna choose one, but it yeah it doesn't represent everything. Um, when I was um, awarded an honorary doctorate by uh, Leeds Beckett University, I had the chance to speak to the students. And normally, the people that get honorary doctorates are famous people or sports people, so they're normally very excited about what they're going to say to them. And then obviously, these three thousand students were like, "Who's who's Fiona Pelham? What's positive impact?" Um, so I really try to create something that was about them and their lives and their future. And I spoke about how, you know, I have a job role that didn't exist when I graduated and um, I created it. And then I spoke to their, their parents and their, their supporters and their adults that were with them and said, you have a really important role to play in supporting your young person in the future. And um, afterwards, one of the academics said, that's, the most moving speech we've had this week like that's actually given the students something and I, I notice I remember that as a moving moment because I think wow we spend so much time in events just talking out just having <laughs> noise happen what what are we doing about thinking what do those what will make a difference for those people to hear like how are we training ourselves to really mm -hmm think and 
provide a, a listening in our speaking, so to speak. Um, so, so I love the thought that those 3,000 students left that room thinking, oh, may, maybe I don't need to go into my corporate job. Maybe I could mix my two passions and, mm -hmm. and create a job that is something that I've always wanted to do. So, but yeah, I know tonight I'll close my eyes. And I'll be thinking, oh, I could have mentioned that moving moment or that moving <laughs> moment. There, there's, that's, I do love, I, I genuinely love humans and who yeah. we are as humans. So I feel so blessed to have had a life where I've been able to travel so much and be with so many different humans as all these photos that you're seeing um, and have so many moving moments with humans. Well, it's really clear that you're, connected to the opportunity of our conversation is to make a difference. Mm. Um, well, I, I have to ask this question because I, I've never traveled to Copenhagen. You've chosen to live there. Yes. What, what, why is Copenhagen so awesome? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think so many people always ask me, why are you in Copenhagen? Did you did you meet a, a Danish guy? And I always get to answer with a, a really great story that back in 2016, I was um, chairing a big association for event professionals. Um, I was regularly the only female in the room and I was always the only person talking about sustainability. And I could just sense on the horizon a bit of burnout if I didn't move myself to a place where I could see sustainability and I could see gender equality in action. So I did a bit of a tour of Scandinavia, very much fell in love with Copenhagen. There's events all the time happening in Copenhagen. It's a very cultural place. At about 3.30, if you go outside, you see loads of people biking on cargo bikes, the bikes with the boxes at the front, loads of dads picking up their kids. So you see gender equality in action every day. And yeah, I mean, my life this morning, I got up at six o'clock and I could kayak um, to watch the sunrise. And that was just so lovely. So I'm very happy that I've I've chosen to move to Copenhagen. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a place that represents my values, I think. Well, so I get uh, to live. The, the That slogan, we're Danish, we're in this together, uh, certainly applies to we're earthlings, we're in this together, yes, doesn't it? Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. Gosh, Fiona, it's just such a privilege to talk to you and really such a deep inspiration. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.